So friends, for today's video, we're gonna be looking at episode two of Pluto. Last week, I did a first impressions and then I segued into the reaction review hybrid. This week, it's just purely going to be spoilers. So if you haven't watched the episode just yet, I just wanted to give that heads up just in case. But jumping into it, after how last week's episode ended, last week's meaning <laughs> when I watched it, this isn't coming out week to week. But when I finished up that episode, I was really nervous that the serial killer responsible for the deaths of these powerful robots was going to be Adam. I was nervous that somehow, especially with this being somewhat built upon the idea of Astro Boy, I was nervous that he was actually going to be the antagonist, but pretty quickly it establishes within this episode that he is just one of the other powerful robots. But I was, I was just very upset <laughs> after N2's death. So I think I was, uh, really willing to be like, oh my gosh, who is it? And then whoever came on screen after that was like a duck imprinting on whoever they first see when they're born. So because he popped up right away, I was like, is it him? Jumping now into the specifics of this episode. When it first starts off, we kick it off with there being another victim of this supposed serial killer. This time though, it's not one of the robots, but it is once again, somebody who pushed for better rights for robots. And the exposition, I know before I was commenting on the fact that it is very heavy handed and cliche with how it approaches its almost crime noir aspects. And it is continuing to do that. I feel that it is an interesting mix of cliche was sort of the word of the day last week. And it, I probably overused that word a little bit, but there are elements to this that are really cliche but simultaneously that are really out there and bizarre. And that's an interesting mix. It makes for your your feelings as you're watching, it fluctuates a lot because on one hand you're like, ah, oh, okay, this is almost borderline corny. And then all of a sudden it'll do something really abstract and different or it will hit a really significant topic and it catches you off guard. And I complimented this last week, this combination, because I was noting that I feel the cliche elements pull you in with this false security and then it builds upon that false security by then pulling the rug out from under you. I think it's continuing to do that. However, when those moments of extreme cliche exposition occur, it does, I don't know, instinctively it grates a little because the dialogue and the delivery is just, you could insert this into, it feels like any crime noir story because during this scene, just to actually give clarity here. During this opening where you're seeing this other victim and the detectives are there, the guy starts to say something like, uh, he's like, you mean to tell me that this is another one of, and just the like recap, filling the person in. And it's similar to, and a lot of writing advice will tell authors and creators to avoid using the term, well, as you know, because because they do want to clue the reader or whatever form of content you're consuming. They want to clue them in on something. And so they'll set up a scenario where characters will be talking to somebody and the character will be like, well, what about this? And then the other character says, well, as you know, and then they fill them in. And you're like, very few people actually say that phrase in real life because you don't note and acknowledge the thing that the character, that the human being in front of you, if it's real life, you don't be like, well, as you know, that doesn't really happen. So I do feel like, man, some of the dialogue, it's like, it's so difficult to not be annoyed almost, if that makes sense. But again, I think it actually serves the purpose of the story. It ropes you in and you're like, oh, and then it catches you off guard later. So it is a weird feeling to be simultaneously thinking, ugh, this is, uh, been there, done that, and then go into weirder territory. But anyway, moving on, I also, I'm trying to ground myself as I'm watching, so I'm, like, trying to keep track. Okay, Switzerland and Germany, that's where Mont Blanc was, that's where N2 was, and then also I have international robot laws, because those are the things that a lot of these individuals that are in trouble are pushing for, so I'm trying to ground myself and get all this established, because we are starting to branch out and get into, okay, so there's details about a war in the past, and it seems like a lot of these robots were tied to this war. But then after that, it is noted when there's a conversation with Adam and Gassette, where Adam is 
it, it, they're having conversation about how like, wow, you're just like, you act like a person. You even pretend to really enjoy food and things like that. And you learn that he almost had this star quality back when this war happened, this peacekeeping mission. And he was deployed during that. And apparently it was this big controversy because of the fact that he looks like a child. So I thought that was a... I mean, it's interesting just to see how his appearance gave people the feeling of unease because they're like, well, but he looks like a kid. But then at the same time, people will look at robots not as people. So it's just sort of <laughs> people's reactions can be completely based off of the spectacle of everything or how things look as opposed to the substance of something. But anyway, I really enjoy this conversation between Adam Gassette and Gassette, excuse me, especially because in the first episode, Gassette actually doesn't have a lot of dialogue. He's just sort of on the case. He's observing a lot. You, as the person seeing it, you're kind of noting, okay, he must be a robot too because I saw him just tap his face and he has a gun for a hand, I guess. But you don't actually see him communicate all that much. And then here you actually see him have a conversation. You're like, oh, this is nice. This is actually kind of wholesome. The conversation does end very cryptically. As one example, you see Gassette once again kind of clutch his head because Adam is talking about essentially having been mistreated. And then Gassette seems to have a reaction to this. And I noted that he had a reaction to hearing about being scrap in the first episode. And I was wondering if he is made up of parts that are from other robots somehow, or even maybe a human somehow. And thus he has certain memories that get triggered from time to time. And these, this is an example of that perhaps. I don't really know. I imagine that's not s supposed to happen because everybody's always like, are you okay? <laughs> Nobody's like, oh, you need an update to your system. It's, it doesn't seem like it's normal, but that happens. And then they're both talking about why would this potential serial killer go after people and they're ha they're saying something to that effect and then they're like I think you know and they're like yeah and I'm like why <laughs> I want to be clued in ah uh, it's so frustrating when they know and you don't know I'm like I want to know too I will say though there were two things that were very different extreme ends of the aisle here there was one thing that was really funny to me which is that Adam is asking, hey, can I see your memory chip? And he's like, oh, uh, no, you can't see that. There's confidential information in there. And Adam's like, hmm. And he's like, oh, okay, I guess you are a better model than me. And he hands it over. And you're like, wow, that didn't take any convincing whatsoever. You just sort of shrugged and then handed it over, which I thought was greatly amusing. But then when Adam is like, I have to pretend to go to the bathroom to better understand what the human experience is like. And then he goes and he cries in the bathroom because of something that he saw. And I'm like, what did he see? What did he see? I wanna know. Then from there, we see that Adam is meeting up with the detectives from the beginning of the episode. And man, the robot hating detective is super obnoxious. <laughs> He's so annoying. But anyway, I also wrote my notes, best 3D printer ever. That technology is amazing when they can recreate the crime scenes so that they are able to look at it back where they are at as opposed to having to stay at the location. I thought that was really cool. I liked that incorporation of the technology and how it ties into the investigation. Then we segue to Adam discussing things with what would seem to be this very nice, almost mentor-like individual. And Hank Hippopopoulos, I believe is the voice actor. If you don't know what that is, that's fine. But anyway, so they're having a conversation and he's sort of giving some more additional details about things in the past and who this person might be based off of certain information because the individual who was killed at the beginning of the episode, they were after something where they could then warn this man that, oh, you're in danger. So Adam is going to do that for the victim. And during this conversation, something called Bora comes up. It seems like they don't really know. And they're just going into details behind well, this country had this ruler and he was doing things that other countries took issue with. And then this other country in North America was like, oh, I bet you have WMDs, basically. I mean, <laughs> this is a scenario where even though obviously this is a an altered history and this sci-fi, this whole society is built upon an altered history. I'm like, that's not too altered. <laughs> That's pretty tied to things that have actually happened. So I actually wasn't anticipating whatsoever that a show that is an Astro Boy retelling, essentially, and that is about 
a serial killer after robots and humans that are kind to robots. I didn't expect it to go into let's criticize how superpowers kill a lot of innocent people for their own gain and then they lie to people about it. But I really, I'm glad it went in that direction because I think that it went from just being this sort of crime noir story to being something a lot bigger. And I always appreciate when any form of art is able to be critical of things that have occurred in history. So I actually was, I mean, it was very on the nose. I'm not by any means trying to act as though I was able to pick apart and realize what it was saying. I mean, it's very upfront about who it's being critical of. We then get a bit of a flashback of the time when you were seeing war occurring and you see sad Mont Blanc, which made me really um, bummed out because I noted that in the first episode without even knowing Mont Blanc, I was like, oh, he's my favorite until N2 came up and then I loved N2 as well. But I'm like, why are the best of them being destroyed and killed? I really like these two. I don't, I don't like seeing Mont Blanc sad and it, he seemed like he cares so much about the environment and trees and nature and trying to educate people. And then you're seeing him be used as this war machine, this weapon, and I don't like it, and I don't think he liked it either. He doesn't really talk much, he's just there sad. With two other individuals that introdu get introduced, uh, Brando and Hercules, so this is when we're kind of more formally introduced to some of the other robots. That's a lot of what this episode is, is sort of cooling you in a little bit more into the greater plot. You see that Adam was the peace ambassador during this time, and how the other ones almost have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder about the fact that he got to be the golden boy of their crew and got to do the thing that led to him being sort of this idol as opposed to being out actually on the battlefield having to kill. There is a line that I wrote. It says, hate, it fuels their wars, but I don't even know what it feels like. And this is a quote from, I believe specifically the character Hercules. It's right during this scene of introduction to these two. And I really appreciate that because I think a lot of sci-fi stories that incorporate some form of artificial intelligence or robots, I do find that one of the central themes often is what defines a person's humanity, what makes a person a person. And I do feel it is important to at least touch on that if you're going to have a society where you have people advocating for them to have more rights. It, it just makes sense to the world and I think it deepens it and it fleshes it out a lot more. So to have the robots themselves though questioning, this is, I understand the concept of what has become the catalyst for this destruction. I understand it from the idea of like, that's the reason, but I don't know what that feels like. So I do think it's kind of interesting that these things that you see, like the robot hating detective, there are pieces of them that make people think less of them and that make them think, well, how could they ever, if they don't understand human emotions, you also see Adam, this is being portrayed really well in his scene with Cassette, where they're like emulating what it is to be a, per a person so they can better understand. Well, if they don't understand, this is the logic of people like the detective, then that must mean that they're lesser and that they are worse. But in a way it's interesting because it's like, well, humans, even though we can, and this is something the detective says to Adam, like you, you can't even tell when something tastes good, that kind of thing. So because they don't know that, then that makes them lesser. But simultaneously human beings are capable of such great levels of destruction and hate. So who's actually, more humane. I really do appreciate these kinds of topics coming up. And I do think that that quote alone was a really succinct way to illustrate that. Anyway, then we segue into modern day for these characters that have been introduced and you're seeing them fight in these, these suits. Then you're learning a little bit more about Brando and where he's been since the war. And I immediately, I wrote, Brando is for sure going to die. There's just no way because this show is leaning so hard into the tropes of all oh, the family man. I mean, you knew the whole time, you knew something bad was gonna happen to N2 and I keep calling him N2 as a reminder, his name is actually North. But anyway, you knew that something bad was gonna happen to him. And then we look at this scenario and you're like, ah, oh, he's adopted five kids. He's got a wife. He obviously is really compassionate and he's doing what he can. He's gonna for sure be killed. There's just no way he's not. 
I think at this point, what would have been surprising is if Gassette had been killed or if Adam had been killed, but you're setting this guy up to just immediately be like, ah, yeah. I also noted, though, during the dinner scene with the children and the wife and Brando and Gassette, that Gassette says something like, it, it was the most fun he's had during dinner in a long time. I'm paraphrasing, but it was something to that effect. And I was like, what about with his wife? I, I don't know if they just, because he's a robot, maybe they just never sit down for dinner and maybe that's all he meant by that. But I do wonder, because there was an interesting dynamic between him and his wife that you barely see because it's kind of one of the things that starts the first episode. But there's almost this coldness between them, or at least there's a coldness, maybe not between them, but surrounding them in some fashion, like something's going on and they're talking about like, maybe we should take a vacation. And I don't know if this comment was just some nice little compliment he was paying to this family and his friend, or if there's something that this can tie back to whatever's going on with his wife. But I guess I'll have to watch and find out. I unfortunately didn't get the exact quote, but another thing that I wrote down was the idea that humans build statues because they're quick to forget. I thought this was something worth discussing because I think that one of the central themes that is developing that is a little less upfront is the idea of memory. You saw this with N2 when he was going through the fact that he can't forget everything he's seen and done. And he berates himself. He puts himself down as a result of the things that he isn't able to forget. Whereas he turns around though and has so much, so much compassion for Paul despite the fact that Paul was so unkind and cruel to him, but he tells him he deserves to remember his dream and he deserves to make art again and to make something beautiful. And he wants to make something beautiful, but he almost, in a sense, doesn't feel like he deserves it because he can't forget the things that he's done. And I just think it's kind of interesting that we've kind of tapped into that again with this particular quote, that humans have to build statues because they're so quick to forget. And just uh, once again, sort of the, who's really the antagonist here? Who's really the one that is less humane? I think it's a way to sort of not only have a theme of memory, but to tie this in with that moral question that pops up within so many sci-fi stories. Then we get to what is the really obvious thing that we all knew was going to happen, which is that Brando as a way to try and get revenge for Mont Blanc you're seeing that he is driving his truck with his suit and you're like, ah, he's gonna lure the thing out. That's what I wrote in my notes. I said, is Brando trying to lure it out? And I said, yeah, it looks like. And then uh, I wrote, their robot suits are intense because you see the, he, you see him getting into his and I was like, whoa. Cause at first I was wondering like, can a human use one of those? And then I'm like, oh no, I don't know if that's possible <laughs> with how they like leave the body behind. But the, anyway, so, I'm like, all right, he's gonna die. And then he's fighting it and they all sort of had this connection, which I didn't realize was possible. I didn't know they could all connect with one another via some kind of channel. And they start to do that, they being Hercules, Brando, Gassette, and Adam. And then Adam happens to be in the car with the other individual that he was speaking with earlier. And they're all sort of experiencing basically the death of their friend. And that part was quite sad, but I do feel like it was so heavy hand not heavy handed, that's not really the right way to put it, but I just feel like they weren't shying away from, like I said, really rubbing it in, like, guess what? This guy has a family and something to live for. And he even has a lot of dialogue where he talks about how he really doesn't want to die because he just wants more time with his kids. So get ready for him to die. <laughs> I feel that them all experiencing it simultaneously when he starts to say certain things and then Hercules is like, hey man, we still got to have our fight, you know? And you're like, oh, they're just trying to, I feel like they've already accepted it also. And so they're just sort of trying to make it a more peaceful moment. Cause there is a switch at some point they keep saying, just hold on, just hold on. And then it goes from just hold on to almost, almost banter. It's like there's a switch at some point to acknowledging, I don't think we're going to make it. So let's just try to hear him out. I do think that the way in which they portrayed within the imagery, his final moments and thoughts, where he keeps seeing glimpses of his wife and his children, I thought that was 
very well done. And I do think it's worth complimenting because of the fact that it was so obvious that this was going to happen. But then to still kind of pull at the heartstrings with this imagery, I thought was quite well done. The end of this shows Hercules is paying for the retrieval of all of Brando's, the suit's parts from, it would seem, his own pocket. He doesn't have any interest in fighting anymore. You have this obnoxious person who is insisting, I'm going to sue you if you don't show up for the fight. And he couldn't care less about that guy. And then this sort of a dun-dun-dun moment when they find the arms of the suit on an island nearby, and they are once again in the form of the horns. You also see the horns sort of on the screen when Adam is projecting one of the things that he saw during those final moments. Adam was able to see some of what was going on, and he puts that on the screen in the car. So you're getting this strange imagery again, and this ominous tone of, it's Pluto, but what even is Pluto? And knowing okay, well, the investigation has deemed Pluto destroyed, but you're clued into the fact that no, absolutely not. There's something that is still out there and is still going to prove to be a threat. So I did really like this second, excuse me, this second episode quite a lot. I think that the first episode was so different in its structure, especially for a first episode of a show. I thought it really took a chance with almost splitting it into an introduction and then a short story. And I will say, I think I was rather fond of that decision. This one though is nice in that it's sort of pulling you further into the greater plot. It's starting to clue you in into more of the details, more of the history behind things. And it's allowing you to try to theorize about what the motivations might be and who the culprit might be. I don't really know that we actually have a chance of knowing that yet, but I do like that we're getting that information. These episodes, certainly feel like they're within the same show. I'm not trying to say that they're so different that I might as well have just stopped watching episode one or anything like that, but I do feel like they served different purposes and they went about their storytelling in different ways, which I like. I think that allows for the watching of the episodes to be more engaging because it's not the same format over and over again. So I did enjoy this and I enjoyed it as a second episode. I am continuing to enjoy this show. I am looking forward to watching more. I do want to give a quick heads up for anybody that saw that I posted a rough schedule of when I was going to be talking about these episodes. I might tweak that slightly and actually combine certain episodes at some point in my reviews. So just be on the lookout. I'll always have in the thumbnails which episodes I'm discussing in case you want to be really careful about spoilers if you're watching this slowly, but I am really enjoying it and I can't wait to continue on. But anyway, thanks so much for watching. Feel free to let me know your thoughts on this episode. If you want to give non-spoiler thoughts about the rest of the show, feel free to do that. Thanks so much for watching though. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll see you later.